Right. I know that the terms are sometimes confusing for the general public, but there's a contrast between tame problems and wicked problems. Let me explain. A tame problem is a problem which is bounded. It's containable. You can know all the things you need to know to be able to fix that problem. And very important within that is that you can know when you know enough to stop learning and start doing. So let's take an example. Something really complicated. You want to build an aircraft carrier, right? A huge industrial system integrating all sorts of different technologies, aeroplanes, ships, propulsion, electronics, all these things. You can do that. And it's a tame problem because at a certain point you know enough about all of those specific sciences to say we can now build the aeroplanes, we can build the radars, we can know the metallurgy, we build it, you get the point. An open system problem is one where we cannot know when we know enough to know that we know enough to be able to start to do something. Now there are many things in the world that are like this, but the biggest thing in the world that's like that is how the global climate works. Many, many years ago, uh, in my knowledge of these things, the most ingenious and inventive mind to think about these problems wrote a book which has become very famous in ways that mean I think he didn't really intend. And this is a man called James Lovelock, and the book is called Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth. And the heart of it is not a religious proposition, which is how many people have taken it up. It's actually an incredibly simple and powerful appreciation of how the open system of the climate keeps the atmosphere that you and I are breathing, and everybody watching this is breathing, which keeps the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere stable and steady at 13% in content, with all the different fluxes of energy and stresses that there are. And the heart of this is what he calls cybernetic control, feedback mechanisms, which keep things stable and level. Now, the climate works that way. And most of the things that we would need to know to be able to be absolutely certain that we understood all of these different feedbacks that meant that we could therefore predict with certainty the weather, let alone the climate, and we're pretty bad at weather forecasting, let alone going way out into the future. Those are things which we actually don't know. And the huge problem that we've fallen into is that once the issue of so-called climate policy, and I'm putting it inverted commas deliberately because I'm so skeptical about whether you can actually have such a thing as a human created policy on the climate. The idea that you could do that was predicated upon an incorrect statement of what the science was telling us. Because what we were presented with was a narrative from scientists who said that the more we learn, the more certain we are, as though it was a, a tame problem. But that's not what knowledge of open systems teaches us. Here we are in 2011, and we now know much more clearly than 20 years ago. We now know much more clearly what we don't know. So that we know that the Hansen hypothesis about close coupling between human action, the emission of carbon, temperature, extreme events, those connections are much more complicated and they are much less direct than the political hypothesis that underlies the whole apparatus of this, this Roman candle of climate policy that we had in the period 2005 to 2009 suggested. The central difficulty that liberal agenda have tended to encounter uh, is a combination of two things. Firstly, the belief that the state can be a controlling a controlled and benign agent for social change in a very substantial way, often from the United States because you think the grass is greener on the other side of the Atlantic, the European social democratic model is seen as being successful in that regard. But I think that there is a deeper problem, which is this example of climate policy is an absolutely perfect illustration of it, which is that there is an essential hubris 
about thinking that we can understand enough about how wicked problems work to make it sensible to think that you can have a direct policy on these subjects. Now, the difference between uh, people who believe in the benign effect of government, um, the language is different in different parts of the world, you call them liberals over here, uh, they're socialists in Europe, um, and conservatives, is that there's a different appreciation, a different belief about the scale of what governments can do. Most people these days uh, believe, most sensible people in my view believe, that there are certain things that governments clearly have to do. I mean obviously there are night watchman functions which uh, in the view of Europeans, but not North Americans, uh, not all of them, uh, we think governments should do. We think that the government should have a monopoly of violence, for example. I don't want guns wandering around my society, thank you very much. I want soldiers to have those. Uh, and, but then you have a debate about the larger things that government can or should do. And where you come here is very much to the outer edge because you're talking about, if you want to do this, and in Europe we have been trying, extraordinarily intrusive government actions which change in quite considerable detail, force change on the way people live their lives. The dangers are that you can do that sort of thing, you can con the people, but as soon as they find out, then you break trust because they then feel that they've been actually taken for a ride and they will really switch off and that is exactly what is now happening.